final session of the 35th ASEAN Roundtable on dealing with a volatile world. Moderating this session will be Dr. Malcolm Cook, visiting senior fellow with ISIS Yusuf Ishak Institute. Joining him on the panel are Mr. Bilahari Kausikan, Mr. Sihasak Kwangkep Kiao, and Dr. Martin Natalagawa. Now I will turn over the time to Dr. Cook. Dr. Cook, please. Thank you very much, Melanie, and good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to everybody. Uh, I'd like to start with two thank yous and two technical notes before I pass over to our three speakers. So first, I'd like to thank everybody who's RSVP for the third and final session to this roundtable. 200, over 260 people RSVP'd, which is more than twice the size of the ICS uh, physical seminar room. So one benefit of COVID-19, a small one, is that more people can attend the round table than that if it was just uh, on-site at ICS as it has been in the past. I'd also like to thank the three speakers for uh, agreeing to come to this panel. All three have, each one of them has quite a bit of experience in regional diplomacy in ASEAN, the focus of the final session, and are truly good friends of uh, ICS and have supported the Institute for a long time. I'll go in the order of the uh, program. So I'll first ask uh, Bill Ahari, the chairman of the Middle East Institute at the National University of Singapore, which is just around the corner from ICS uh, to talk for 10 minutes on the theme of ASEAN's agency and great power rivalry, uh, US and China rivalry being square in all of our thoughts, uh, particularly with the US election coming up. Then I'll pass over to uh, Sihasak, the former permanent secretary of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Thailand, uh, and recently a visiting fellow like me at ICS as well, to talk about multilateralism in the post-COVID world. And then finally, I'll hand over to Pak Mati, the former Minister of Foreign Affairs in Indonesia, and recently published his book, Does ASEAN Matter uh, with ICS Publishing? And he'll be talking about revisiting regional resilience and neutrality. I've asked each speaker to speak opening comments for about 10 minutes, and then I'll switch over to a moderated Q&A where I'll be the moderator. Uh, two reminders. First of all, if you want to ask questions, please use the Q&A function of the Zoom uh, and please tell us who you are and your affiliation if you wish. And as noted by our MC, this session is under Chatham House rule of non-attribution. So if you would like to attribute something one of the speakers said, you have to go to them first and get permission. Uh, so with that, I'll hand over to uh, Bilahari, please, to talk about ASEAN's agency and great power rivalry. Thanks, Malcolm. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, let me start with a general, perhaps even philosophical point. There is always some agency, even in the most seemingly dire circumstances. And this is demonstrable both historically and theoretically as a characteristic of all human systems, whether they encompass your personal affairs or international relations. There's always something to be done. There's always agency, but of course, whether we have the wit to recognize it and the agility to encourage to use it are entirely different matters. Of late, observers have begun to question ASEAN's agency, usually for all the wrong reasons. This is not new, it happens periodically and there is a tiresome repetitiveness in many of the criticisms. I'm not claiming that ASEAN is beyond criticism. Having agency does not mean you will always use it wisely or correctly. But as I have too often had to point out, it is utterly useless to criticize a cow for being an imperfect horse. I want to focus my presentation on, what, on some of what I think are valid criticisms. First of all, let me point out that some of us take some of us unfortunately take some of our critics far too seriously, and some of us take those who flatter us far too seriously as well. In both cases, this leads to a degradation of agency. We either think action is pointless or unnecessary. This is not trivial because a sense of fatalism can be fatal to small states, as fatal as a sense of complacency, and I think we are 
in some danger of being infected with both. Now, being in the midst of great power competition is not a novel experience for ASEAN. ASEAN was born in the midst of Cold War major power competition, and on the mainland, the Cold War was far from cold. One of ASEAN's fundamental purposes is to maximize the agency of its members in order to preserve national autonomy in the midst of major power competition. And the approach is to manage relations between me members so as to minimize the opportunity for external powers to take advantage of internal divisions to advance their interests at the expense of our interests. In short, to enhance regional cohesion in order that we may have the autonomy to pursue our own national interests. How it works in practice was neatly captured in an Indonesian slogan that has somehow fallen out of use. National resilience enhances regional resilience and regional resilience enhances national resilience. Singapore's first foreign minister, the late S. Rajaratnam, made much the same point at the signing of the Bangkok Declaration in 1967, when he said that henceforth the regional interests must be some part of the national interests. Now, it cannot be denied that this sense is weaker in some of the newer members than in the original members. The most notorious example occurred in 2012 in Phnom Penh when ASEAN for the first time failed to agree a joint communique because the then Cambodian foreign minister refused any compromise on the South China Sea. Speaking about a year after that debacle, Hun Sen, Prime Minister Hun Sen said supporting China was, and I quote, Cambodia's political choice. Now this betrayed Cambodia's lack of understanding of how ASEAN works. We are an interstate, not supranational organization. No member is required to give up its sovereign right to define its national interests as it chooses. Cambodia's right to make its own political choices was never an at issue. What was at issue was whether Cambodia had in any degree taken the regional interests into account when making that political choice. One of the mistakes that ASEAN made was expansion without adequate socialization of new members. But that's water under the bridge. It should also not be forgotten that less than a week, less than a week after the fiasco in Cambodia, thanks to the tireless efforts of Pak Mati, who is with us this morning, ASEAN did reach consensus on six principles that still form the fundamental basis of the ASEAN consensus on the South China Sea. It's a weak consensus, but nevertheless still a consensus. And reaching any sort of consensus after that highly contentious meeting was no mean achievement, as is maintaining it for eight years. This was an exercise of agency whose significance should neither be exaggerated or downplayed. The great power competition that now confronts us is, of course, US-China competition. This is less immediately dangerous than the previous US-Soviet competition, but also more complex. It is less immediately dangerous because while the major powers, China in particular, are not without their proxies in ASEAN, the devastatingly destructive kinetic proxy conflicts of the type that characterize the Cold War in Southeast Asia are today highly improbable. In fact, as, as during the Cold War, nuclear deterrence makes war by design between the principles highly improbable. The so-called Thucydides trap in which the US and China are destined for war is a particularly foolish theory. Accidents could happen in the South China Sea, but if they do, I think they will not involve proxies because the likely proxies do not have the capability and the principles will act quickly to contain the matter. Taiwan is a different issue, but that's beyond the scope of this event. Now, this is not to say that those inclined to act as proxies can, cannot get into serious trouble. To state things bluntly, I see Cambodia and Laos teetering precariously on the edge of making a parallel mistake as that which led to very tragic results in the late 1960s and 1970s. That mistake is to entrust what agency they have to an external power or trying to be neutral. Neutrality does not, it does not mean lying low and hoping for the best. True neutrality means knowing your own interests, taking positions based on your own interests and not allowing others to define your interests for you by default. But I don't think all is lost. Uh, neither Cambodia nor Laos may care very much about the South China Sea, but they must care about control of the Mekong, 
because that is an existential issue to them and ultimately involves regime survival. Well, we shall see. They have some difficult choices to make, and if they should make wrong choices, they will confront ASEAN as a whole with difficult choices. We may have to cut loose the two to save the eight. That is a drastic situation, but it's worth thinking about because that too is an exercise of agency. For now, what we need to know is that while less dangerous US-China competition is far more complex than US-Soviet competition ever was. This is one of the reasons I think using the metaphor of a new Cold War to describe US-China competition is intellectually lazy and dangerously misleading because it distorts the essential nature of that relationship. This is an error that several ASEAN members have fallen into and it limits their strategic imagination. The US and the Soviet Union led competing systems and their competition was over whose system would prevail. The US and China are both vital components of a single system and compete within that system. The US and China compete while entangled in a web of supply chains of a scope, density and complexity never before seen in the global economy and which certainly did not exist between the US and the Soviet Union. These supply chains distinguish the current type of interdependence from previous periods of interdependence and condition the nature of US-China competition. Now this has created a more complex environment for all of us and complexity of a different sort than during the Cold War, when the fundamental choices may have been very difficult but were essentially binary. The complex supply chains within which the US and China compete make their competition far from binary even though both sides would like to force binary choices upon each other and force binary choices on us. Some bifurcation in specific domains has already occurred and more will occur as they try to mitigate their vulnerabilities. But the very complexity of the supply chains, especially in the technology domain, makes a total across the board decoupling of the US from China improbable. As improbable as China creating an entirely new alternative system or becoming totally self-reliant. If, if these are, are their goals, both will fail. We should not be paralyzed by complexity. Complexity, in fact, creates agency. In any situation, complexity broadens the range of choices because the course of events is never entirely predetermined and therefore depends on choices we as well as others make, which in turn further opens out the range of choices. And this is what distinguishes the complex from the merely complicated. I don't want to exaggerate the point because the choices are never infinite, but they generally do always exist in some degree. At very least, we need not align our interests in the same direction across all domains. As a strategic crossroads, Southeast Asia, indeed the Indo-Pacific as a whole, is a naturally multipolar region. Multipolarity enhances agency because it maximizes maneuver space. Southeast Asia is not and is very unlikely to be ever in a purely bipolar situation. Not all the poles will be of equal weight, but, where, but they do exist and whether we realize it or not, ASEAN created forums like the ARF, the EAS, the ADMM Plus do help promote the natural multipolarity of our region by providing additional supplementary platforms to anchor major powers in our region. Please note, I said additional and supplementary platforms. They are never going to be the sole or main platforms, but they are instruments that we have created and we should think hard about how to better use them for their essential purpose. That essential purpose is not necessarily problem solving, but as anchors. What we need to think about is how to make them more useful and interesting anchors to our partners. And we have not been very creative in this respect, generally resting on our laurels and just doing more of what we have always done or retreating into painfully detailed consideration of housekeeping uh, matters or making speeches at each other and pretending that they are strategic discussions. We have not optimally used the agency we possess. Why is this so? In a word, the answer is leadership. I do not claim that any of what I have been describing is going to be easy. As I pointed out at the beginning, agency depends on having the wit to recognize it and the agility and courage to use it. Earlier generations of ASEAN leaders at all levels faced even more daunting, situ daunting situations and were able to deal with them. 
And it's not that the present generation of ASEAN leaders are more dull-witted or timid than their predecessors, but they now operate within more complex and pluralistic domestic political environments. And this is true even of the one-party systems. It's harder to get domestic consensus and without domestic consensus, there can be no regional consensus. I point this out not because of nostalgia for Southeast Asia's non-democratic past, but merely as a reminder that few things are wholly good or wholly bad and that leadership and agency begins at home. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bill and Harry, for both a very clear presentation of a very big issue and being right on time. Um, I note that so far there are no questions in the Q&A, so I hope that'll pick up as the speakers um, move forward. I'd now like to ask uh, Mr. Sihasak to uh, take the floor and give us his opening uh, comments on multilateralism in a post-COVID world. Over to you, Sihasak. Well, uh, good morning and thank you, Malcolm. Certainly, it's a pleasure for me to be a part of this panel discussion, along with my good friend, Bilahari and Bakmati. I certainly welcome the opportunity to share my thoughts on the subject of multilateralism in the post-COVID-19 world. Of course, the COVID-19 is still not behind us yet, but I think it's good to look ahead how multilateralism will evolve in the aftermath of COVID-19 because ASEAN regionalism is based on multilateralism. Now, the first point I like to make is that COVID-19 has brought to light and in fact accentuated both the need for and the crisis of multilateralism that we have witnessed even before the pandemic broke out. Multilateralism has come under tremendous stress and strain because of the growing sentiments of anti-globalization in many countries, particularly in the US and the EU, coming both from the right and the left. It is also because of the return of the geopolitics of great power competition. These have manifested in the rise of nationalism, populism, unilateralism, protectionism, and Sinophobia. I think for many people, globalization is equated with multilateralism, which are blamed for the loss of jobs, loss of control over borders, and a sense of loss of national sovereignty. It's also obvious that under President Trump's America First policy, U.S. is no longer willing to exercise its leadership role in multilateral institutions and fora. I think it was a tremendous blow to multilateralism when the U.S. decided to withdraw from the Paris Accord, the TPP, UNESCO, the UN Human Rights Council, and withdrew funding for the WHO at a time when funding was most needed. On top of that, we saw during the COVID-19, during its height, that the US-China strategic competition spilled over into multilateral institutions and bodies such as the WHO and the UN Security Council. The deliberation in these international bodies were bogged down by US and China engaging in a blaming game on the handling of the pandemic. So clearly, as we look ahead to the post-COVID-19 world, these trends working against multilateralism will continue and most likely will intensify. On the other hand, the COVID-19 pandemic, given its unprecedented magnitude, has brought home the reality that multilateralism and international cooperation is as imperative as ever, if not more, in an interdependent and interconnected world. Of course, ideally, the COVID-19 crisis should be a wake-up call to generate momentum for long overdue reforms of the multilateral systems and institutions that were created after World War II 
to better reflect the structural changes in the international system, the shifts in the distribution of power, the rise of developing country, and the transformation of the global economy due to new technologies and digitalization. I think what nobody wants is the worst case scenario leading to fragmentation of multilateralism along geopolitical fault lines, whereby coalitions are formed according to different visions of the international order. The outlook for multilateralism will depend in no small way on global leadership or the lack of it. The outcome of the US elections will also determine significantly how multilateralism will evolve going forward. The election of President Trump will likely mean more of the same. Now, if Vice President Biden wins, it's most likely that the new administration will be inclined towards multilateralism and asserting US leadership once again, in spite of the pressing problems on the domestic front. Nevertheless, the strategic competition between China and the US will not go away, but perhaps it will be more efforts will be made to better manage competition and cooperation between the two major powers. I think under the present constraints, um, many countries are talking about new forms and a new pathway towards a more functional multilateralism. There have emerged concepts such as flexible multilateralism, multilateralism, pluralism, and networks of multilateralism as a way forward. There is also the idea of inclusive multilateralism, whereby relevant stakeholders, the private sector and civil societies are also engaged. And what these ideas envisage is that like-minded countries and parties working together within and outside and across international institutions to rally international cooperation, to deal with common challenges, especially those that related to common public Goods. A case in point is the Alliance for Multilateralism, initiated by France and Germany, which Indonesia and Singapore are part of, aiming at strengthening the role of the UN and WHO in the face of the COVID-19 pandemic. Regional organizations such as ASEAN will also have to step up to the plate. The concept of regionalization of multilateralism and the multilateralization of regionalism has been widely discussed. Closer partnership between the UN system and regional organization can indeed help to fill in the gaps and voids. Now this brings me to ASEAN and its role in the context of multilateralism in the post COVID-19 world. It's a given that rules-based international order is the prerequisite to regional peace, security, and prosperity of ASEAN. At a time when multilateralism, multilateralism is under siege, ASEAN cannot be bystanders and must contribute actively to strengthening multilateralism in the region and beyond. The success of ASEAN as a regional organization is because ASEAN is committed to both regionalism and multilateralism. In the aftermath of COVID-19, ASEAN will confront many challenges, promoting economic recovery, the rise of China, the rising geopolitical competition between the US and China, and the erosion of the rules-based multilateral order. ASEAN will need to strengthen its regionalism and multilateralism. The immediate challenge is that of economic recovery. Given the fact that the global economy will take time to recover, ASEAN must rely on generating growth from within 
by advancing our integration and dealing with the proliferation of non-tariff barriers. This will help to attract investment that are diversifying their supply chain into the region. In countering protectionism, ASEAN needs to push for the realization of ASEP this year and to advance other regional free trade arrangements, such as between ASEAN and the EU, in order to show up the multilateral trading system. I think the severe impact of the COVID-19 pandemic requires ASEAN to focus more on the UN sustainable development agenda, in particular on human security in areas of health, social safety nets, and economic disparity, consistent with the concept of a people-centered ASEAN. The geopolitical competition between the US and China will most likely intensify. Each side will be putting forth its vision of the regional order. ASEAN will need to actively pursue its centrality in the multilateral regional architecture that it has created. I think it's an opportunity for ASEAN to move forward in advancing the ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific in shaping a multilateral and multipolar regional order that is open, inclusive, and rules-based. Now, the final point I think is looking ahead, ASEAN's unity and centrality will be challenged and tested. The ASEAN way will need to be reinvigorated and recalibrated to meet the challenges of a post-COVID world. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Si Hasak, and again, for being uh, even a bit early, just under 10 minutes, so that's very good. Uh, both speakers have kept us on time, which will give maximum time for question and answers, which have started to flow in slowly, but I hope uh, it'll start to pick up space. Uh, I'll now hand over to Pakmati to be our final speaker before Q&A, and Pakmati will be talking on the theme of revisiting regional resilience and neutrality in uh, this uh, volatile world. Over to you, Pakmati, thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Pa Markham, and thank you for inviting me to participate in this dialogue, and always a great pleasure and, and, and honor to be the same platform as Pa Siasak and Pa Bialahari as well, and other friends. Uh, ASEAN, uh, all of us within in this region, have, been, have become rather adept, uh, rather able at describing and recognizing, and even sometimes analyzing uh, the challenges that we face. Uh, in a how we are quite eloquent, in being able to readily identify what are the problems and what they mean and what are the implications for ASEAN. For instance, we are now extremely familiar with the constant reminder of the challenge posed by US-China rivalries. There is both deepening, it becoming more intensified and at the same time, it has become widened as well. It is no longer only in the domain of political security, but increasingly, as we are witnessing, it has become multifaceted. It is uh, affecting economic relations, trade, finance, and even uh, technology as well. Uh, less often cited, but uh, one not to be uh, amiss, is the other geopolitical tensions uh, that is also prevalent in our region. In the recent months, for instance, we have been reminded that there is uh, an issue, a dynamic to be managed between India and China uh, on relations to do with its border, for instance. But there are other dynamics as well. Uh, we are well uh, informed of China-Japan dynamic, probably less so in the dynamic between China and Russia between the Japan and the Republic of Korea. In other words, the uh, intensification of uh, rivalries and trust deficit is not one simply of US and China, but as well of another other major power relations as well. 
we are also adept and, and able to describe and pinpoint a number of potential flashpoints in the region, South China Sea, East China Sea, the Korean Peninsula, of course, the Taiwan Strait, India-China border uh, areas I have mentioned before. These are well-known uh, challenges that we face. And as Pa Siasak just now has described uh, uh, eloquently, we are familiar with a sense of uh, multilateralism that is adrift, that is a challenge at this critical juncture. And, and this is most clearly manifested as we all try to deal with the challenge posed by the COVID pandemic. The point that I wanted to say is, how can we as a region go beyond simply describing? How can we as a region be simply go beyond describing and analyzing what are the obvious? How can we identify a certain roadmap, certain clear actions to respond and to anticipate these developments? Specifically, for instance, when ASEAN, uh, as far as US and China is concerned, how can ASEAN proceed beyond describing the challenge? How can ASEAN proceed beyond expressing exasperation to lament and to express worry about US-China relations, to express hope and that they, they be left alone, that they, they don't wish to be forced to choose or even to simply remain quiet and hopefully and hope for the best that this thing somehow will go away. But of, of course, that is not likely to be the case. And as a result, ASEAN will become increasingly fragmented. In other words, there must be a better script than simply complaining. There must be a better script than simply worrying and expressing hope that we be left best alone. I believe ASEAN today has a choice if it is to thrive or it's simply to wither. And, and the choice is for ASEAN to make and to pursue. For instance, when recently ASEAN began to speak of a neutral Southeast Asia, of course, an idea that was much popular in the 1970s through the Zopfan principle, where the idea of a neutralized ASEAN was mentioned. Can neutrality and centrality be synergized? Can we honestly say that we are central to all the region's development and at the same time we are saying we are neutral? Leave us alone. Neutral in the most passive sense. Can outlook, such as the Indo-Pacific outlook, which is so well-crafted and well written, can it self-implement? Or is it simply potential that still requires leadership to actually be implemented, be manifested? I was rather struck and, and actually quite uh, encouraged when I read in the Indo-Pacific outlook, the notion of ASEAN playing an honest broker. I thought that was a rather courageous uh, statement of intent. But when we declare openly and publicly that we wish to be honest broker, we have to deliver. We can't simply say this is an outlook uh, and then hope that no one really uh, call us to task. In my view, and I agree fully with Pa Bilahari's point earlier, we have had so many episodes in the past when ASEAN's future relevance and continuity have been questioned obituaries have been repeatedly written on ASEAN. And I am convinced and I'm confident that this time around ASEAN once again will prove its doubters wrong. That we can prevail, we can remain relevant, ASEAN matters, but that won't come uh, by itself. 
it requires ASEAN being able to proceed beyond uh, describing events, beyond analyzing challenges, but actually identifying concrete actions. Specifically, in my view, before I turn to the actual specific action that I, I have in mind, I think ASEAN must demonstrate two types of qualities. On the one hand, a sense of realism. ASEAN must recognize its own strengths and its own weaknesses. It must manage expectations. ASEAN clearly is not a supranational organization. It brings sovereign countries with differing foreign policy orientations. And that must be the starting point. We must not try to pretend that we can have some kind of a common foreign policy, but instead we must ensure that the diversity of our foreign policy outlook becomes our strength rather than our weakness. Strength in diversity, being able hence to be able to reach out to all the, our different partners because all of them can find comfort in and within ASEAN. Realism as well of the reality of major power competition. I think uh, the reality is, whether we, we like it or not, US-China uh, rivalry is here to stay. It is not something that can be wished away. And actually, as far as ASEAN is concerned, we are quite familiar with competing major power rivalries in our region. It's not the first time that ASEAN has had to deal with this. In the past, we've had different manifestations and different shape and form during the Cold War. It is not, ASEAN is not untested in this kind of situation. Hence, our outlook in terms of realism, I believe, first recognizing our own limitations and our strength. Secondly, in terms of realism, to recognize that major power rivalries, competition, including the US-China competition is here to stay. It's not something we can simply wish away. But at the same time, I think we must have a sense of idealism as well. We can't simply be, have that type of outlook and character. I believe ASEAN must recognize, must continue to be imbued with a sense of recognition of what is at stake. Being concerned with peace and security in this part of the world is not a luxury because all of us in this part of the world have been uh, beneficiaries of peace dividend in our region. The long peace that we have enjoyed have enabled us to pursue economic prosperity, economic development. Hence, when we preoccupy ourselves on matters to do with peace and security, it is not a waste of time. It is very real, of real consequence to us. And I hate to see a situation when countries of ASEAN see foreign policy in very domesticated manner, as if when we are, these are issues that shouldn't concern us because it's too far from our concern. I think that type of notion must be set aside. A second idealistic outlook, idealism, I believe, conviction of ASEAN's uh, potential to make a difference. ASEAN can make positive difference. ASEAN can be a net contributor to peace. And last and not least, idealism in the sense of ASEAN's transformative capability. We can transform the dynamic of the region. Look at what we did in Northeast Asia. Prior to ASEAN plus three, which ASEAN give, helped give birth to, the relationship between Japan, Republic of Korea, and China, there was no process whatsoever among the three countries. ASEAN, through ASEAN plus three, managed to plant the seed of Northeast Asian cooperation. I believe, continue to believe, and I shall constantly hammer this point, that in our region, we continue to face at least three types of challenge, trust deficit, among major powers, territorial disputes, and how to manage geopolitical shifts and change. And hence, I will con constantly be of the view that we need remedies such as uh, TAC-like instrument for the wider region, 
a non-use of force commitment, not only among ASEAN, but this time among the non-East Asian countries, uh, non-ASEAN countries of the East Asia Summit, and the promotion of what I had called in the past dynamic equilibrium in our region. But today I want to be a little bit more specific as I conclude my remarks. Instead of talking about the TAC-like instrument or the, or the notion of dynamic equilibrium. I'd like to be a little bit more specific in highlighting the need for ASEAN to narrow down its immediate tasks, if it is to remain relevant, if it is to, to maintain our peace and, security, this peace and security in our region. Namely, the specific task by ASEAN to promote a crisis management capacity in our region. I believe our region today faces the risk of conflict arising out of miscalculation, so-called unintended conflict, uh, where an incident quickly uh, spiral out of control to become a major crisis and possibility of unintended co conflict to flare. I believe that ASEAN must develop the toolbox to be able to anticipate, to early detect a brewing crisis and take the necessary action. It is not an impossible outlook. We have done it so, in, we have done so in the field of uh, natural disasters, for instance. ASEAN has developed early warning capacities, developed uh, responsive, response capacities, and I believe this is something that we should be looking at. Specifically, I believe within the ASEAN Secretariat and even the EAS Secretariat within the ASEAN Secretariat, there must be a pool of resources built for the ASEAN Secretariat to quickly be able to identify emerging crises and inform its member states, here are crises that is potentially going to confront ASEAN as a region. Without pretensions of, or, or, or pronounce, uh, announcement of position politically, without prejudice to the position of countries concerned, but simply to identify emerging crises. I think this is an in-house capacity within ASEAN an ASEAN crisis response system that, are, that is timely for the ASEAN Secretariat to develop. And secondly, since clearly what is needed is not only technical secretariat capacity, but we need to have the requisite political will and political comfort level, I believe that there is a need to develop some kind of a entity within ASEAN and the East Asia Summit, which I call the East Asia Summit Peace and Security, Peace and Prosperity Council, whereby member states of the East Asia Summit can regularly meet um, at the ambassador's level in Jakarta to review the region's development. Because as we all know, the TAC Council within the TAC had never been formally convened and possibly perhaps will never be convened because it's such a a uh, uh, difficult process to invoke and to trigger. But we do need, in my view, a council within the East Asia Summit, within this ASEAN, to be able to regularly update itself, member states on developments in our region. Recently, we have seen developments in our region that could have had uh, terrible consequences in terms of peace and security on the Korean Peninsula, India-China border situation, India-Pakistan before it, the South China Sea constantly, the Taiwan Straits uh, issue as well, East China Sea. But somehow, we have been lucky, in my view, that in, mo in all these cases, somehow some kind of a channeling and modality was found to manage the potential for conflict, and it didn't flare up. But the question that we must pose to ourselves is, where was ASEAN in all this? Did was ASEAN at all relevant in all these dynamics? Did we make ourselves felt in terms of making, uh, uh, enforcing the, the path towards peaceful solution? 
I recall, for instance, just to give an example, when the India-China border issue flared up recently, it was at the same time, if I'm not mistaken, and please correct me if I'm wrong and I apologize in advance, it was at the same time when the ASEAN foreign ministers and the ASEAN regional forum and the East Asia summit foreign ministers level were meeting virtually. But when efforts were being made by the two parties to manage and to solve the problem, the foreign ministers met in Moscow, if I'm not mistaken, even at the same time as ASEAN foreign ministers and the East Asia summit were meeting. I think that is a, a, a gentle reminder for ASEAN, if it is to, to claim to, to have relevance and, and centrality, we must deliver more than simply become a forum for statements, delivery of statements. Hence, in my view, one specific uh, pathway is the development of ASEAN crisis response system within the Secretariat and among the member states. And finally, before I conclude, uh, very quickly on multilateralism, I agree uh, wholeheartedly with the point that Kun Siasak had, had mentioned earlier uh, on multilateralism, and, and, uh, and, and I, I defer to all the statements that he has made. My, my main point is simply to relate it to ASEAN. Uh, colleagues may remember, in 2011, ASEAN adopted the so-called Bali Concord Tree. Bali Concord Tree has one single message, ASEAN in a global community of nations. It is a, a conscious attempt to present ASEAN as a united uh, and cohesive group of countries within multilateral setting whether it be on climate change, on disarmament, on environment, broader environment issues, on sustainable development. We have the wherewithal. We anticipate this all the way back 10 years ago for ASEAN to be able to develop a more cohesive approach, outlook in a multilateral setting. Because I remember, I, I remember I'm sure Pabi, uh, Bilahari and pa Siasak will recall meeting at the UN, sidelines of UN General Assembly, we debated how can we be more than simply talking about elections? How can we support one another's candidates in UN-related issues? And we raised our ambitions to the Bali Concord Tree. But today, as we speak, before we, we be a net contributor to global issues, the first and foremost issue in my mind, in my belief, is that we be sure that within Southeast Asia itself, there are no issues that burdens the international community, whether it be developments on the Rohingya issue, other, other, other internal issues within ASEAN, we must make sure that there is no burden that, it, that ASEAN project to the international community. And in this connection, Kun Siasak would recall when Thailand and Cambodia had the border skirmishes issues in 2011. That's why we were so quick in 2011 to have a coherent ASEAN position at the UN Security Council to make sure that we, are, we have the responsive response to the UN and therefore we are not bringing new problems to the United Nations. Those are some of my initial thoughts that I wanted to share and I've do apologize for being so lengthy and uh, look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Dr. Cook and distinguished panelists for the very engaging session uh, to bring the 35th ASEAN Roundtable to a close. Now I would like to invite Ms. Sharon Sia, coordinator of the ASEAN Study Center to give the concluding remarks. Ms. Sia, please. No. Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, the 35th ASEAN Roundtable was conceptualized with the theme COVID-19 crisis, its impact on ASEAN and the way forward. Back in March, we were optimistic that perhaps COVID would go away as it did with SARS in six months or so, but it became apparent by mid-year that COVID was a pandemic of a truly global nature that was not going away soon 
Instead of thinking of a post-COVID-19 recovery theme, we shifted to an examination of an ongoing crisis. The format also changed, where we would have had the pleasure of personal networking over one and a half days at a physical venue, we moved to a virtual platform of three sessions, each no longer than two hours, bearing in mind that it is very difficult to sit in front of a screen for any longer than that. But happily, the profile of our participants, again thanks to technology, became an international one, with viewers tuning in from the USA, Europe, and other parts of Asia Pacific. Thank you for staying on with us, despite the time difference. We have heard from experts who have clearly given much thought on how ASEAN can navigate through this crisis in the last three days. On the first day, Mr. Choi Shin Kwok, director of ICS, urged ASEAN to shore up its resilience to forge for a better post-pandemic ASEAN. The senior minister of state for health, Dr. Ko Po Kun, urged ASEAN to cooperate in five areas to overcome the crisis. The first, to enhance ASEAN solidarity. Second, build robust healthcare systems in each of our countries. Third, to maintain trade flows and keep supply chains open. Fourth, to accelerate the adoption of digital technology. And the fifth, to cooperate on vaccine multilateralism. How ASEAN responds today will determine whether ASEAN forges ahead or falls behind in this crisis. In her assessment of ASEAN's COVID response, Professor Meli Caballero Anthony of RSIS commented that ASEAN had fed comparably well, a fact that was highlighted by Christian Ashler of KAS in his opening remarks. And this was also uh, repeated in this panel, where all three panelists assessed that ASEAN had performed not too badly. But further regional cooperation is needed, such as the development of the ASEAN Regional Reserve, the idea of an ASEAN CDC, the promotion of ASEAN as a manufacturing or even a supply hub for vaccines, the development of common travel protocols to aid in the opening of borders. Dr. Jonathan Lassa from Charles Darwin University then picked up on the idea that the interoperability of a country's national crisis framework should be integrated within the ASEAN framework to make for a meaningful regional response. The role of governments as drivers of disinformation and misinformation under pandemic conditions and the changes in the information society was also discussed in the first panel. On the second day, regional economists gave a scorecard of ASEAN's performance. In ASEAN, we like scorecards and roadmaps. Selena Ling, the chief economist of OCBC, pointed to several silver linings on the horizon. First, ASEAN has performed economically better than other regional blocs. Second, ASEAN has benefited from China's first-in, first-out recovery, as our economic linkages have intensified. There was evidence of China's machinery exports growing significantly, and this gives pause for hopes of growth. Third, ASEAN is well-positioned to leverage the global supply chain reshuffles. And finally, digitalization and e-commerce appear set for a growth trajectory in ASEAN. Dr. Jayan Manan from ISIS also pointed out that the US-China trade war and COVID-19 were not the inducers of the current economic problems. They were the accelerators. To overcome this, the AEC agenda and ASEAN economic integration will play an important role. But more importantly, ASEAN must be ready to act. Tan Sri Dr. Munir Majid from CARI, CIMB ASEAN Research and Advocacy, said that ASEAN's headline numbers were all excellent, but what was lacking was an urgency within ASEAN to make decisions faster to achieve integration. ASEAN needed to stop pushing paper around and up its game. Even in the economic panel, the idea of regional vaccine cooperation was not very far off. Here, the economists called for ASEAN to move away from vaccine nationalism by pulling together to buy vaccines and embark on mass testing so that borders can open safely again. The regional economic outlook should a vaccine deployment be possible in the second half of 2021 was for a 5 to 7% growth. The worst case scenario without a viable vaccine would be to see growth rates hover around 0 to 2 or 3 percent rates. And now we move to the next one. It seems that we cannot escape discussions of the ASEAN way. Dr. Jonathan Lazar warned that there was no single ASEAN way in crisis leadership and management. 
And in the economic panel, there was a question whether the ASEAN way was hindering or helping the economic response efforts. Perhaps there is nowhere but here in this panel on geopolitics that discussions of the ASEAN way holds the highest premium. Here, Mr. Kalsikan talked about individual agency of ASEAN member states and the collective agency of ASEAN, with the example of ASEAN exercising agency in the South China Sea issue. We are warned about the control of the Mekong Delta region being an existential issue, not only for mainland Southeast Asia, but as a strategic issue for ASEAN as a whole. Laos and Cambodia were named as the two weakest proxies in China's sphere of influence in the Mekong. Here, Ambassador Villahari, who does not mince his words, talked about cutting loose the two to save the eight. Ambassador Villahari's point was not to dismiss this thought as an exercise of agency on ASEAN's part, dramatic as that suggestion might be. In these three days, there is agreement that ASEAN with COVID crisis still in full swing is at the strategic crossroads. Speakers talked about Southeast Asia and Indo-Pacific as a multipolar region. ASEAN has not optimally used the agency it possesses. There is a lack of leadership. But leadership and agency begins at home. This was picked up by Ambassador Siha Sak that the multilateral agent agenda needed global leadership. Ambassador Siha Sak also reminded us that ASEAN needs to pursue its centrality, advance its outlook on the Indo-Pacific to shape a multipolar regional order that is open, inclusive, and rules-based. The ASEAN way needs to be recalibrated to handle the challenges of a post-COVID world. And then we heard from Bapak Mati with this question. And I almost, I empathize and I feel that same frustration. How can ASEAN respond actively beyond describing the challenges and expressing its aspiration? There must be a better script, he says, to address this. And ASEAN has a choice to thrive or to wither. The choice is for ASEAN to make. So can neutrality and central centrality be synergized? The nexus between ASEAN centrality and unity is manifested in two dimensions. First, ASEAN itself must matter to its own members. Centrality therefore begins at home. Second, the alignment of national and regional interests requires the wisdom and courage to accommodate regional interests as part of national interests. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, if there is nothing you take away from the past three days, then it is this. To borrow a millennial slang, it's time for ASEAN to get woke. The time is now for ASEAN to take regionalism by its horns, put money where its mouth is, and be the driver for ASEAN integration. Advocate for an open multilateral agenda, show an example to the world by keeping trade flows open, supply chains moving, multilateral cooperation alive, and some of these um, concrete suggestions were made, such as to improve ASAC capabilities, um, not taking a passive stand. Um, ASEAN must make institutional changes from within, develop capabilities for an early crisis detection, and implement these concrete actions that have been spoken about in the last three days. And only by acting in solidarity can ASEAN, and here again, another millennial slang, slay this pandemic and emerge stronger and build back better. So in closing, my deepest appreciation to all our speakers and moderators over the last three days. Special thanks to Bapak Mati, Ambassador Si Hasa, and Ambassador Bilahari, Dr. Malcolm Cook for their time this morning, and to you, the audience, for your active participation. With that, I call the 35th ASEAN Roundtable to a close. Thank you and stay safe wherever you are. <laughs>